step up. Um, I mean, how long were you married before your husband went abroad? Um, well, we came to this house in uh, 1930, at least. Uh, we weren't in this house very long, because I lived at home for six years, you see, and then I came here. And then, uh, 1939, you see, he, he went, he was called up yeah. with the rest of them. Well, then, of course, he didn't go to the front, he just went to, he was training in this country for a little while. And then from here, he, of course, he went to France. Yes. But, from the, uh, you see, but, uh, but just before then, he was going to sail, and they hit a wreckage. And then he, uh, he wrote to say, are you going to take all this down? Oh, he wrote to say that... Don't uh, worry. Oh, um, Just tell us what you can remember. Yeah, if you send a pound, I can come home for a weekend. So I sent this pound, and he come racing up on a motorbike. So I don't know what you wanted the pound for. <laughs> that was the first start, we had that weekend. And he went back again, and uh, I didn't see him again. Oh, that was, uh, oh, four and a half years back. Did you get letters? Oh, I got a few letters, yes. Can you remember but, your uh, first letter? You know, what you were doing? Well, not really, you see, because there was so many, you know. But he sent me a photograph of himself, you know, and he was telling me about how good the French people were and all about that, you know. And, of course, the, they had been bombed then, and he was telling me different things of what had happened. You know, there was one farmer who wanted to give him his farm. A French? A Frenchman, yes. And then there was a, a I don't know if it was the same one, but one, um, they were bombed. And he said he had uh, five Zoom, uh, that, 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 and he'd only got, I don't know, just two or three children left. And the others were buried on the farm. Oh, gosh. You see, well, and I had a, a, this Frenchman give him a rosary, which he sent to me, and I still got it. Yes. So he was able to send things? Oh, yes, he sent, uh, he sent those to the post. But uh, other little things, as he sent, you know, he used to send me lots of these um, uh, threatening bits, you know, the eight corner octagon threatening oh, bits. Yes. But they used to get lost in the post. Of course, the, um, I went down to the postmaster and asked him about them, and he said, oh, they go through rollers, and as they go through the rollers, you see, they're squeezed out. So I didn't get the threatening bits. But, and then, uh, of course, there was the uh, next thing. You know, so you uh, heard. Well, before that, I had a dream, and this is perfectly true. I had a dream, and I saw my husband sitting in here. There was my husband and his brother-in-law and his brother, mm. and they're all. But there was only two of them that were in France, and they were covered in mud. That was before we heard about the evacuation from France. Yes. Well, the next thing, I was quite a while before I heard whether it was here, uh, whether it was safe or not. Anyway, I had a telegram to say he was safe. Who sent you the telegram? My husband. Yes. But my brother-in-law, they didn't know where he was. But anyway, he did get out safe. Mm -hmm. Well, the next two... Uh, thing, of course, I went to visit him at Rill. Then he was at the Isle of Man. You see, for a short while they were guarding the prisoners of war there. Oh, I see, yes. And they wouldn't, uh, they let so many go, but of course, the time I applied to go, they'd stopped it because they said there was too many mines, and they frightened of the boats getting blown up. Yes. So they wouldn't allow us to go, you see. Yes. And the next thing I heard was, They'd all been fixed up and they'd gone to, uh, they'd gone out again. And uh, then the next thing was, as he'd been taken off the boat with fever and malaria. 
anyway, and then... Uh, you knew this by le because of his letters, he was able to write to you? No, I, don't, I, di I didn't hear from him. No, I heard it from hospital. It said, um, your husband is now out of danger and is convalescent. I didn't even know he was ill then. And then afterwards he wrote and told me all about it, you see, to be taken off this ship. Well, then he was sent to another regiment, you see. He was in the RAs and then he sent, he was sent to the Royal Horse Artillery. Mm -hmm. And that was when as they went out. Now, they went out to Italy way, but I just can't tell you where, you see. Well, then, of course, your weeks and didn't have letters. And the next thing I knew was, I had this letter that said, uh, um, no, what do you say? From the war office to our, your husband is missing, believe, killed. You see. Well, that was when I got this situation on the buses. I was on the buses then, I went straight away. You see, from the Michelin sold and got this job. Yes. I was on the bus and I just took the telegram to show it to them and just said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I, think I, I don't think I could concentrate today. So he says, well, have today and tomorrow off, that was Saturday and Sunday, and see how you go on. Yes. See, and then let us know if you feel like. I said, I'll be in on Monday. Mm. I thought, well, it's no good staying at home. You can't only sit and mope. Yes. So I went in on Monday and... Uh, from then on, we seemed to, I seemed to get everybody coming to me. Understand, people as their sons were prisoners of war, people as their husbands were prisoners of war, mm -hmm. you see. Thinking as I knew all about it, which I didn't, yes. you see. And then... Um, were these sort of actual meetings or just people that you met? People as I'd met on the buses, as I heard, as my husband oh, was yes. prisoner of war, you see. Yeah. Well, after that, um, I waited 11 months. I, know, I didn't know whether he was alive or dead. I had this letter from the war office to say that um, you had so long that your present allowance, which was the enormous amount of two pound one and six, then my husband was made sergeant major and I got seven and six more, and maybe two pound nine. Well, I had a letter from the wharf to say is my husband uh, hadn't been, uh, oh, what do they call it, made up into, it was made officially, but it was. So they decided to stop me seven and six a week. But I kept all correspondence, you see. Yes. All the letters my husband sent me and all the letters as I had from the war office and everything. Yes. So, of course, I had a drop there. Well, I went, um, of course, I had to go out to work. There's no other option. Couldn't live on that. Yes. Sit still. Well, I went to um, to work and I had a let another letter from the war office to say, if I heard first as to whether my husband was alive, would I let the war office know? Yes. Well, eventually I did. I had a telegram from the Pope. The Pope? From the Pope. Well, I suppose it would be from uh, the uh, clergy, you know, those yes. in the Vatican, but it was from the Pope, and the Vatican was on it. But whatever happened to that telegram, I never knew, and I kept it for years. Mm -hmm. And it said that Gunnar Ford was now a prisoner of war, and I should be healing from them, you know. That's quite some weeks before I heard from him. And just ignore him. And anyway, the next thing we knew was, um, it was in PG-59. Yes. No? Well, after that, he, um, I got letters about once a month, you see. Just leave them, just ignore him. Hey! The next thing I knew was, um, as I say, I had this letter from him to say, and but here, come on, if you want a drink, come on, go have a drink, go on, have a drink. That's it. No, 
Okay, we'll dribble all over if you like. <laughs> I had a... Um, I have to think what happened there. I had this letter from him. Oh, I sent to the war office. That was it. But they didn't uh, drop me money because with it being under the 12 months, you see, I had the, just the £2.16. Mm -hmm. Well, after that, uh, I used to get these letters about once a month. Uh, if I met the postman, he'd tell me if I got a letter. And if I met a... And then there used to be a chimney sweep has got on the bus. <laughs> he'd say, you go home and there's a letter for you. Oh. And there was. I never used to know how he knew. Yes, I never Yeah, knew. there was a letter. Well, they always used to say, if you have a chimney sweep on your bus, you were lucky. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, and then there was these letters come. Well, of course, you just carried on and went down to the... Well, first of all, I used to send the parcels on my own. They cost me pounds. Until someone said, why don't you go to the Red Cross? Yes. Well, then I found out where the Red Cross was, which was down Stoke. Yes. And I used to go there and send the parcels every month. Yes. What sort of things did you send? Blankets, pants, vests, pullovers, socks, chocolate, cigarettes, tobacco, things like that. Yes. And then... Uh, you see, well, of course, you used to give them as much as you could afford. Yes. I had a friend I used to go down with her, her brother was a prison war, but he was in the, um, he's young there, you know. All right. Uh, he was in the Marines, but he got repatriated. Yeah. And my husband went, uh, uh, was there, he was all right, he used to send me letters like that one, I showed you there. That was from PG-59, anyway, that letter was. Yeah. And then he wrote and told me that he'd had some good news and that probably he might be home for Christmas. I don't know what I did. <laughs> oh, we've been on the bus. You see, I used to meet all the farmers. You'll have a good laugh over this after. And each one I met, I used to say no. Mrs. Ford, do you want any poles for you? I said, oh yes, I think, well, I seriously think my husband will be home. Have you got a towel and a duck? Yes. Well, I asked everyone, and they used to leave them in the, they left them in the porch, I couldn't get in the porch, the towels and duck. Everyone, as I asked, had left one. Well, I had to ask different ones if they'd like to buy them, because I couldn't eat them. But anyway, when Christmas came, and uh, I heard as Italy had give up then, you see, I thought, oh, he's bound to be on now. But uh, the next thing I heard, he'd been transferred to Germany, been caught. But he did escape, you know. But before that, let me tell you, there was an advert in the paper. Would anyone with relatives that were in the Camp 59, please go to this house, it was in Port Hill, would you please get in touch with them? Mm. Well, I read this notice in the paper and I took the paper and I went, it was in Orford Street. And uh, when I got to this house, it appears, this lady, and I can't tell your name now, I've got a brother in this camp. Well, his name was Wilf, Wilf Farham, I think his name was. And so I did write it down and said, well, and so I went, yes, Wilf Farham. And I went to see her and told her my husband was there and I asked her what she wanted to know and she said she hadn't heard from her brother for so many weeks and um, could I write and ask my husband about it. Well, I wrote and asked him and um, he said, he wrote and told me that the last, he saw Will Farham being marched out and that was the last that they ever heard of him. They don't see him again? No, nobody saw him again. So whether he got shot or what happened, we don't know. Mm. And uh, 
Every year the tower's on them buses. And you know Port Hill Bank, don't you, as it go up? Well, we always used to get stuck on the bank. And she always used to send her son out to see if I was on the bus. We always had a big jug of tea. Yeah. Every winter she used to do it, you know. How many, yeah. about, sort of how many letters did he get? How, how often did he write to you? From, was he allowed to write? Well, he was only allowed one once a month. But sometimes... What, to receive one? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if he could exchange cigarettes or food and anything for a letter to somebody who's got no one to write to, he used to get more, you oh. see. Okay. That's how it worked out. And... Uh, Were they to censor at all? Oh yes, we're all sensitive. I had one letter with them. Dear Steady, I am very well. Your loving husband, Jack. And all the rest were just black. Mm. Black tap. Marty! Was there any censorship on the letters that you wrote to him? Oh yes. Yes, I sent him a photograph. You see, this one, as he sent to me, with this photograph on, you see, that was allowed to come out of Italy. Well, I had one done, you see, and they did that for me at the PMT office. But they took the photograph off, they sent the letter, but they took the photograph off at the war office and sent it me back. And uh, the reason was where I had it taken was at on rail front. And there was a soldier in the background. And they said they couldn't allow anything to go through that showed a soldier or anything else on. Right. You see. And that was what happened. Then, of course, you got your little uh, nasty little bits of different people as were on the bus, as you see. People, as if you couldn't get them on, they used to. I know one woman said she hoped to bomb a drop on the bus as we were going to Newcastle. That was one thing because we couldn't get everybody on. Then another time, then um, what happened? This oh, so that this was rather a nice do. Had 120 airmen, and the bus broke down. So that meant I had to sign 120 passes, so they wouldn't get into trouble when they got to the place. And I stopped every car going to Market Drayton for them to be picked up. Mm-hmm. And when the bus come, I hadn't got one left. The, the relief bus, you know, to take them. I hadn't got any soldiers left, so we just <laughs> went in empty, you know, and brought the passengers out. <laughs> but uh, it was very nice. I got a thank you from the officer, so... They used to tease me about that a bit. They said they wouldn't go with me because the bus broke down when I was on, you know. <laughs> but uh, that was one of the nice things, you know. Lots of nice things happen, but when you're there, you know. You... Did it, were there, um, was there a lot of voluntary work going on for the prisoners of war at the time? Oh, yes. Yes. Then I remember another time I went to a meeting. It was in the Merrill Street in the assembly rooms. And Miss Harrison from Mayor Hall was there. Well, my friend and I had been on since half past three that morning. See, there was one very early buses went out. I'd have to get there at four o'clock. And you were out at half past, you see. And I slept all through it. I did. I slept all the time. I never heard a word. And I couldn't help it. And uh, Miss Harrison come to me and she says, You are very tired, aren't you, my dear? I said, Yes, I am. She says, uh, what time did you go on this morning? I said, half past three. I said, I started out as I got to the bottom of the road and met a Yank, an American. And he uh, says, hey, hey there, man. I looked. I said, yes. No time I was saying yes, I was running. You know, he said, can you direct me to the Castle Hotel? I said, yes, we take that turn up there, not turn it down there then. <laughs> <laughs> and I was running all the time. I think I did a mile in four minutes. And that was one thing that happened. Then another thing, you see, I, I lived here myself for about, uh, oh, I said that a couple of years. And then, oh no, it wouldn't be that long. And then a bomb dropped over there. 
I don't know to this day how I got down the stairs. I swear I never touched them. I do. It lifted me out of bed, I think. And I, and I still don't know how I got down the stairs. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, I packed my bag that night. Were you living here on your own? Yes. I packed my bag and I went home. My father just said, oh, I wonder how that girl is on her own. And when he looked at it, he said, she's here, bag and baggage. I said, I don't care where that is, I don't want it. <laughs> well, but I did come back again after a little while, you know. And especially when I heard it's different, the Germans were giving up and all that, you know, I did I come back. And, uh, of course, you see, a lot of uh, things happened when he went to Germany as well. From Italy. What sort of things? Well, you see, when he was transferred to Germany, you seem to get more, more letters, and he seems he was better looked after, got better food and things like that. You see, but uh, of course he was in that reprisal camp, you know, that three five seven. He didn't tell you that, did he? No. no. Well, he was when he went to Germany. What was that like? Well, that was when he. Uh, kept taking all the, they took the beds and different things off them, you know. For putting in chains and what not. They're supposed to do, but not to have it, you know. He brought some of the chains back, they're like little knots of lead, about as big as your finger head, put together, you know. Mm -hmm. Don't wear them, were not right? Lots of things have disappeared, they don't know what happened to them. But it was a, a sad time, really, because I don't know how the other wives felt, but I, I felt very bitter against the Italians. Very bitter, for the simple reason there were so many prisoners of war out Market Drayton Way, Ashley, in that way, you see, mm -hmm. going with English girls, getting on English buses, going where they liked. And I was very bitter. Mm -hmm. But they came. Uh, order out that no Italian prisoners of war were to be allowed on the buses. Mm. And um, I happened to be one of the unfortunate ones as uh, they came to meet the bus too and I said I'm sorry and they were with an English girl. I said you can get on but I'm afraid he can't. And of course I was to think on a farmyard with a dog. But still orders are orders and how I felt I could have run him down. I'd have been a driver. I honestly could have run him down because I felt so bitter. Then another day we went to, um, I was on the relief bus to Baldwin's Gate. We just sat there. Came an Italian prisoner of war down on a, a spun new bike. How would you feel? Your husband was behind wire and there he was running around everywhere in the country on a new bicycle. It makes you feel better, you know. Yeah. But did he seem to be ill-treated then in, in the Italian camps? Well, I don't say he was ill-treated, but they have to be careful, you know. Yes. Of course, he never told me. I didn't know anything really, only what he was telling to your man what you were recording, yeah. you see. But he didn't say, it didn't, doesn't say a lot about what happened when they were in, in the camps. Yes. Let's see. Yes. So you didn't really know how he was by his letters, not really? Oh no, they wouldn't let him write. No, they wouldn't let him write to Did, say. Could you send him, uh, like at Christmas time things, could you send him special things? Could you send him presents? No. You, you couldn't? No. And he, could he send you anything? Well, he did, yes, he could, but he had to send it through the war office. Now, he sent me, um, he sent me 20 pounds once, quite a joke. It was a joke in the camp, too. And he said, you give my mother five pounds for Christmas, and your mother five pounds, and you buy yourself a watch with the remainder. So I sent word back that I'd put 10 pounds deposit on a watch. Will you please send another 10, because it was over 20 pounds. So of course he showed this letter to the men in the camp, you know, it was quite a joke that was. You know. But uh, lots of things, you know. Of course, 
When you knew that he was alive, that was the thing. You see, it seemed, even though he was a prisoner of war, you felt as if, to a certain extent, he was safe. And then, until you heard as they were bombing, and then, of course, then you began to wonder whether they were bombing prisoner of war camps, or things like that, until you got the next letter. Then when you got the next letter, you know, you, you were all right again. But, uh, I don't know, I think it was very, very lonely. It was very lonely that time, you see. And that's when I think you feel bitter and you think that those in Parliament then start the war of sort of... Well, I say, they did me out of five years of my married life. So, and I don't know how anybody else feels, but I still feel the same. I think, I think when you have really had a happy married life up to then, and then they have to go away and you don't see them for all them years, you see. And then you... So how long did you have your married life before he went away? Oh, about six years. You married six years and then, then he went? Yes. Yes, I think to the same year, you see, we come into this house. I think it was just that too, the... Um, King George the Sixth was crowned. He went to the crowning of that. Mm. You see, and uh, of course, it was after that. Were there meetings but, in Hanley for relations to meet? Um, uh, no, in um, Merrill Street, Newcastle. Of course, you start them in different places. What was it? What happened at the meetings? Well, they used to talk about uh, what you could send, and I went to quite a number, you know. But of course, this one I did. I went to. See. And, uh, but uh, used to tell you what you couldn't send and what you used to put in letters and um, how they were being treated. If there was anybody that had escaped, you see, it used to come to that meeting and tell you if they met your relations and how they were being treated and all that. Well, um, I went out to Ashley to um, a public house. I went there purposely to see a soldier that had been a prisoner of war in that camp and had escaped. <laughs> and he was telling me uh, different things, you know, and uh, that things, as I found it after, were not true. He was telling lies, you see, mm -hmm. saying about the old treatment and all that. Mind you, I know, to a certain extent, they had to do what they were told. They couldn't get out of the camp. But uh, nothing like that was happening, as so he was saying, you know. But of course, then, uh, uh, that worries you. You have to wait then to see what's happened and if they're being ill-treated. Mind you, if they were, they couldn't tell you properly. No, they couldn't. Did you find that there were a lot of wives who had uh, husbands in the same camp? No. Not in the same camp. Now, on the buses there was three. There was three. Uh, there was two, two more wives. Their husbands were prisoners of war, and one had got a brother prisoner of war. But they were in none of the camps as my husband was in. I want to put him out. They'd be all right with that. Yes. 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 I put him in the garden. Come here. Come here. There you go. Okay. Well, then, where do we get? Where do we get? You're talking about the oh, about wives. the girls, you see, the wives and the... Then we had the... We used to have a lot of sarcasm from airmen that had uh, sort of come from London. We had one, and I, I think I really... Well, I didn't um, get annoyed straight away. No, thank you. I do, but I don't uh, now. Um, and I, he was saying that, you see, when you go to book them, now, there are a nice lot of lads, really. There's only just one here and there. Now, he said, oh, book me a ticket for as quick as a doodle bug drops on London. You see? Well, things like that. And he starts, um, then he starts being sarcastic and saying, you had nothing here, and um, a few of you 
ought to be in the army and a few ought to be somewhere else, you know. Anyway, that weekend, there'd been a, a dance at Ashley and they always used to ask the conductresses, you see, those that were on that turns could go to go. Well, there was one girl, her brother had both his legs blown off. Another girl, her husband had had part of, good part of his stomach blown away, you see. Then there was the two with the husband's prisoners of war. Then there was one with a brother prisoner of war. And then, there was, of course, I was there, my husband was a prisoner of war. And it's rather got you back up when they said things like that to you. So, and I think, uh, you see, the other airmen knew mostly that the girls had got brothers and husbands and what have you in the army and that. And um, uh, I got a bit annoyed with him in the end, and uh, when he was done, and I told him I think I, uh, the best thing for him to do was to keep his mouth shut. I said, because the girls as were on here, I said, were either wives or prisoners of war. And I said to him, I said, that one there, her brother's had his legs blown off. I said, that one there, her husband doesn't know, she doesn't know whether he's going to live, he's had his, part of his stomach blown away. And those two there, their husbands are prisoners of war. I said, that girl there, her brother's a prisoner of war. I said, my husband's a prisoner of war. I said, I think we're doing a good job of work. I said, considering what we had to put up with. Mm -hmm. Well, he came then and apologised. He said, I'm very sorry. He said, he didn't know, you know. That's why you should think before you speak. Not to shut all this up. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I had to put up with all that. See, like another occasion when I was on the bus, when we were going to Bursley, well, you switch, give them a couple of rings to tell me a follow up to send them past, you see, because you couldn't, you can't take so many. And uh, a man pressed the, bot bus, the button to stop. You see, well, I had to go down and tell him I'm sorry. But I didn't press the button, the man pressed it. I said, no, I can't take any more. So, uh, oh, he told me as, uh, I ought to be in the army, I ought to be put up again a wall and shot, and my husband ought to be uh, in the army. I suppose he got a good job. And as it happened at that time, he was missing. So I said, well, I said, I wish he was here. I said, as he, as he could, press that bell. I said, uh, because I don't know where he is. I said, you would just have to wait when you have a letter to say he's missing belief killed. Mm -hmm. I said, you can't do anything. But of course, there are all apologies after, but the damage has already been done then, you see. Mm -hmm. but you actually did receive a letter which said he, he was missing. Oh you? yes, belief killed. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they uh, told, oh I didn't, uh, oh I was telling you, wasn't I? And the, the letter was there to say that your allowance would be dropped within so many months if um, you didn't hear anything. That was when it was 11 months before I heard. But I had a letter to say as he hadn't been more substantiated, that was it. Mm. You see, he's made up to a sergeant major and they'd have to drop my money by seven and six a week. Which dropped me down again to two pound one and six. Mm. And um, of course, I saved all the correspondence and I got the money back when he come home. He sent it me. But, uh, and then I had this telegram from the Pope to say as he was going to afford us a prison of war. But you see, it appears as they put Gunner instead of Sergeant Major. But did, you, did you know that he was trying to escape? I don't suppose you did. No, I didn't. Mm. No, I didn't until he got home. Mm. But I think he told the gentleman about that. He told, he escaped with so many of his men, told them to dig in. But they didn't, you see. He did, he went, he dug right underneath the earth, you see, a tunnel. And uh, of course the Germans come and captured him, that was only escaped, and they kept shouting. You see, they called him Ben. Of course, his uncle was a sergeant major, so the same after you see. Yes. And um, he had to come out in the end, and, and the Germans passed the remark about the, the men, you see, and uh, gave him a cigarette. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you didn't know about his escape until he was... No. Only he was recaptured, was he able to tell you? No, he didn't tell me until he come home. No. Can you remember him? Oh, oh yes. What happened? Oh, yes. Well, I had a telegram. Now, first of all, let me get the, the probe. Um, I went to the pictures. Well, in this pictures, it uh, showed you the camp being liberated, you see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, I saw him. I happened to scream at the top of my voice, you see. No. He was on the film. He was on the film, oh, yes. Oh. And I screamed, he's there, he's there. And of course, everybody looks at you. Yeah. <laughs> and he said to have a little weep. And yeah. of course, and when I come home, you see, then out of the night before, I think it was, they'd stayed up next door. And he said, oh, come come and listen to the uh, news. Jack's been re uh, released, his camp's been released. So I went and listened there, and I knew then, you see. Yeah. So of course, I started to get ready, and I got different ones that said, oh, we'll, we'll save you a bottle of whiskey when your husband comes and wound well, up. I'm still sentimental. And uh, I got these bottles of whiskey and, you know, and, they, and everybody I saw when I had this telegram, no tar. Let me have a hanky. I and them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, oh, you have this bottle of whiskey. So I got two large bottles of whiskey in and a half a bottle of whiskey. I thought I'd save these when he comes home. I pickled dozens and dozens of eggs, jars and jars of fruit, jars of tomato, dozens and dozens of jars of jam. I'd got, oh, I did. I think I did everything as I could, thinking, well, I'll have that plenty when you come home, you know. Mm. Which I did, and then, of course, when he come home, he had um, a diet sheet. Bread and butter and jam and rice pudding. <gasps> that was his diet. Oh. Meals in small quantities and things like that, you know. Because he'd had so little food Yes. Before. Oh, he, his stomach was out here. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I won't tell you what he looked like because he'd be on there. But he did. No, nine months. And um, anyway, but as I say, I had this telegram to say I've been released. We'll be home soon. So, anyway, um, I was showing this telegram round. I was that pleased, uh, you know, at work and everywhere. Anyway, one driver, he's still on the bus, he's now, his name Bill Bennett. He said, so I said to him, I said, now, if my husband comes to Stoke, you will bring him, won't you? Well, he says, I'll bring him right to the door. Well, the, I got everywhere ready and I thought, well, I'll, I won't wait up because I don't know whether he, when he was coming, but I just had this telegram to say he was released. Thank you. Anyway, that night, I was not up. But first of all, he landed in Stoke. Well, this driver, he's like the driver who took the fares and everything, you see, and took the, just like the midnight bus has picked up the troops that were coming home on leave. And uh, there was two girls there, Betty, Betty James, I don't know what her sister was named, Nancy, I think. And they were there seeing, Betty was single, but Nancy was seeing her husband off. And uh, he happened to go to them and said, um, can you tell me whether this bus goes to Newcastle or Elm Crossy? Well, they did see the telegram and they said, are you, are you Edie Ford's husband? says, yes. He said, come on, and picked up his kit bag and his, all his luggage and put him on the bus. Anyway, they run round to the driver and they said, you'd never guess who we've got on the bus. He said, who? He said, we've got Edie Ford's husband. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, um, I came, oh, we sent another telegram to say, as he was coming, that was it. And I was, this was on the Sunday, I was working. 
And uh, my next door neighbour and the one below brought this telegram. And they brought it down to Newcastle. I was setting up on a spare. You see, the buses were, you have so many spares, so I didn't send you on any route. And I was sitting there and I just said to the driver, Oh, I think I feel like nothing off now. And it's just two and four o'clock and I've been on about, only at nine o'clock, you know, because it didn't start early. And when I looked up, I said, Oh, oh, oh. just these it, my next door neighbours. I wonder what's the matter with them. And I never realised, you know, uh, Crosville had their stuff at the bottom of Newcastle town. Yeah. And um, I thought, uh, there was a great queue there. And I just scream, it's come, it's come. <laughs> and there was crowds of drivers, I don't know where drivers, conductors, conductresses, inspectors and all the lot. Anyway, I said, uh, he said to me, he said, I think you, you better go home, Edie. I said, oh, can I? <laughs> so he says, yes, go on. Well, I went home, I left my ticket rack on the bus, all my tickets in and everything. Well, I got up to the ticket office and there was a man there who's since died. And he says, you go home, I'll cash up for you, you'll be all right. So I left everything there and I had my next door neighbour's son with me, he would go with me, you know. And uh, anyway, that was on a Sunday. And everybody in, everybody as I met, you come in, you come for a, a, a drink, come on, my husband's coming home. And when he come on, I got a little drop of whiskey left in the bottom of my hand. I give it all away. <laughs> you know? But uh, anyway, it's uh, about half past three. On the Monday morning, he come home. Well, you know, when they're released, they take all the clothes off them, they delouse them and everything. Mm. You know, they used to tell me, used to give me up, they used to say, well, you know, they allow you when they come from them camps and all that, you know, oh, worrying me to death. So, anyway, as soon as everybody, I opened that front door to him, first thing I said, oh, duck, do you want a bath? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I said to him, yeah. well, I was so excited, you know, and everything. I never even said thank you to the driver. All his luggage was left outside and everything, you know, I was so excited and everything and I never realised. Anyway, he went down and apologised to him and thanked him and everything, you know, afterwards. But uh, then when we got up in the morning, my next door neighbour had whitewashed on my wall at the side there. Welcome home, Jack. <laughs> I never heard, he must have been his stocking feet, you know. Yeah. But all the flags were out down me and everything. You know. But of course, it was all over then for him, I hoped then. But um, he was nearly one of the last before he was discharged. You know? And you hadn't seen him for five years? Nearly five years, yes. I'd seen him one weekend. Well, that was when he came back from France. France. Yes, yes. at the weekend. Did he mm. seem to be quite well looked after there? Oh yeah. Come out of France with the. I, think he, I don't think he got his shoes. Just a pair of trousers. When I saw him, he got an old tunic and a pair of trousers on. A great patch like that. So, as if he torn his trousers behind out. And um, oh, I've never seen such scruffs in my life. But of course, they hadn't been issued. They left everything there. The army issue and everything. And after the war, I had his um, his pajamas, socks, his shaving kit, all his clothes, his change of clothes, and everything back. I think they must have come from the war office or something, mm -hmm. you know. But they were all sent back, sent here to him. Mm -hmm. And the last parcel, the uh, Red Cross sent it back to me. Of course, you've been released, you see. The first time when you went abroad, did you have to, were there any sort of special instructions? Did you, any special preparations? No. You just had a letter saying that he was to be sent abroad? 
No. No, they don't tell you anything like that. They just send them. Yeah, so they, you, didn't, you didn't even know who was going? No, they had, they had an inkling, you know, where the men did, as they might be going, but that was all. Mm. You see, but when I had that uh, telegram to say, uh, if you send a pound, can come home. I thought he'd already sailed. Because mm. he said, that, you see, the, the rumours go round, the men know, really, but the war office don't tell you anything. So, what exactly happened when he was drafted? Um, how did you find out that he was actually going to be drafted abroad? Oh, you get a letter from abroad from them to say... That's the best thing. You get no notification yeah. from no. official. Oh, no. No. He don't. He said he might be going and um, don't worry if I didn't get a letter for a week or two. You mm. see, that was all she got. And I can tell you of another episode and all. And this was at the post office. Well, we used to have to go down to at the back of the general down Newcastle. No. Well, with working, I didn't have need to draw my pension each week. I used to leave it each fortnight. And I used to come up here. My next door neighbour used to pay me the rent. So anyway, yeah, I went in one day and I put me... I was in uniform. Got my books on. You see those great big wine, you have to put them underneath. And there was always some sort of argument or something. They were not nice at all, those girls weren't behind them counters, you know. So this day, she just threw my money under like that, and it all went on the floor. And uh, she said, uh, Will you pick that up, please? I said, No. So, um, I said, I didn't throw my husband in the army. I said, there's no need for you to throw money at anybody. Mm. So she turned to somebody else and she said, would you mind picking that up? She says, no, you come and pick it up yourself. And none of them would pick it up. So I said, but uh, I said, we're tired of being um, treated like this. I said, because what little they do allow us, I said, it doesn't keep us, we have to go out to work. I said, but I'm going round. I went round to the postmaster. I told him all about it. So he says, you go round then, Mrs. Four, and I'll see into this. So he brought a postman with him. The postman come round and pick the money up and put it on the counter, you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I said, I didn't think it was fair as we should be treated like we were. Mm -hmm. As uh, the girls behind the counter thought us we were non-entities or dirt or something because we picked up a bit of pension and uh, I said I wasn't even going to let it drop here I said I'm going to write to the head office but anyway uh, I don't and uh, I went in I just put the telegram on the counter and they just said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I couldn't possibly concentrate today. So um, I said, uh, he said, well, go home and uh, come back when you feel like it. So I said, I'll come in on Monday. No, if you don't feel like it, don't come. I said, I'll come on Monday. And I went on Monday. And I worked all through then until he came home. So you you walked into the office and just showed them just the telegram. Give, yes, that's all. Was he the he was a supervisor? Uh, yes, well it's cashier, you know, and he gave you how uh, to turn. So, well, anyone who didn't turn up, you see, used to bring in the um, oh, what did they call them? Well. Used to bring in a spare, you see, so many spares, and if you didn't turn in. Or oh, if your relief didn't turn up, you see, they used to take over from you. I see. Yes. So, can you remember what you said to the neighbour? You went to see your neighbour when you received the telegram. No. No. I remember crying. That's all. No. I don't. I don't, I don't remember that. Mm. Did. 
So she did. The telegram arrived here, did it, at the house, or down at the well, bus station? I let my house, you see, and I used oh. to come up um, about every other day see if there was any mail. And uh, yes, that was it. And then I used to always go into my neighbour, you see, and leave me rent with her. And I even forgot to leave me rent, and I didn't know. And that's all. That was just a little bit I thought to you. So, so what happened when the telegram arrived? Well, I was sitting in Newcastle Spare, and I was just putting my tickets away in the tin. When I looked up and I saw two neighbours, my next door neighbour, who's my friend as I go out with, and the one below, pushing a pram. And I looked out and I thought, oh, good heavens, they're out early, whatever's happened. And then I saw this telegram being waved like this. One of the girls was waving. Yeah, my next door neighbour. Yeah. Then when I looked, there was more conductors, conductresses, drivers and inspectors walking down the town than I've ever seen before together. Well, I got out of the bus and right opposite, I don't know whether you remember, Crossville's, where they used to go from, at the bottom of the town where the trustee savings bank is now. Mm. Well, there was a great long queue there <laughs> and I jumped out of the bus and I screamed at the top of my voice, <laughs> it's come, Alice, it's come! <laughs> And I happened to look across like this, and it's like as if everybody turned round and smiled, just as if the sun come out then, <laughs> and it was seven o'clock at night. And uh, anyway, the inspector said, uh, he said, I think you'd better go home, and I turned around, and I said, can I? He said, of course you can. Go on away with you. I left my tickets and everything on the bus, I forgot all about them. And I went, and I took her little boy, he's a big boy now, he's 33, into the garage and uh, to cash up. And there was a conductor there, and his name, Harold Grim, Grimley, I don't know, it's Grimley Grimshaw, Grimley, I think. And used to call him Grim. Oh, and he's a nice man. He's since died. And he says, go on, leave your bag, I'll cash up for you. So anyway, I went home, and uh, that was when I had all the neighbours in, we drank all the whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. I remember that. That's what it is. And the neighbour uh, came, I told you about him coming and whitewashing the wall. Yeah. Yes. And we didn't hear a thing. I never heard a thing. For sooner I'll take it and matters, I say.